We're going to have a great time in the Word this morning. So let's pray, and I'm going to get into what I believe God has on my heart for us this morning. Lord, we love you this morning. Lord, we just thank you, Lord God, just for the joy and the privilege of serving you, the joy of getting up on a Sunday morning, Lord, and coming to the house of God, Lord. Lord, I thank you, Lord. I thank you for faithful people this morning. I thank you for people who love you, Lord God. And Lord, I thank you for what you've done for each one of us, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that you paid the price for us. Lord, we'll be forever grateful for what you have done for us, Lord God. And it's the joy of our heart to live for you and our generation, Lord. Lord, I just praise you. I just thank you, Lord, that you ignite a fire on the inside of each person today, Lord God. I thank you that we will be effective believers in our generation, Lord. We love you and we praise you. And in the mighty name of Jesus, amen, amen. Well, praise God. You know, as, as I said a moment ago, you know, it's St. Patrick's Day today. And because, you know, St. Patrick's life was all about Jesus. That's what his life was all about. You know, in his writings, I'm going to maybe quote a couple of things of what he said, you know, in a moment. But, you know, in, in St. Patrick's own writings, is all about Jesus. You know what? Religion has hijacked Patrick and made a religion out of, out of him. But you know what? When you read his writings, there's nothing religious um, as an organized religion in his writings. What's in his writings is all about Jesus. What's in his writings is all about Christ. It's all about praise. It's all about worship. He was a man who loved God. He wasn't a man, you know, of, of, of works, even though he did tremendous works. He talked about salvation. He talked about grace. He talked about these things. You don't see the religious side of man's religion on Patrick. You see him talking about the Word of God. He had a high regard for God's Word. You know, he didn't talk about traditions and all of those kind of things. He talked about the Word of God. He quoted the Word of God. He was a man of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And his passion was Jesus. You know what, today, you know what, across the country and across the world as well, people will celebrate, you know, St. Patrick. And, you know, they'll, they'll celebrate him with, you know what, getting hammered today. You know, that's how they'll celebrate him, you know, green pints all day and, you know, and falling home tonight. And you know what, that would not have celebra uh, been a, a celebration that he would have wanted about his life. He would have wanted people serving Jesus and being a factor for Jesus. And you know what? That is the best way for, our, for us to live our lives, just the way St. Patrick lived his life. You know, when you look at St. Patrick, I just want to talk a couple of things about him this morning. You know, he, he was brought up in, 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 in Britain, and you know, when he, he, was, he was in a good family. And then, you know what? He was taken as a slave against his will, you know, to Ireland. And you know what? In Ireland was where St. Patrick you know, um, found Jesus for himself in a personal way. You know, he, he, he was brought here as a slave. You know, Patrick said of himself, he says, my name is Patrick. I am a sinner. You know, he didn't put some kind of like saint in front of his name. He called himself Patrick. And we're all saints who are in the body of Christ. You know, if you know the Word of God, we're called saints. The epistles were written to the saints at Ephesus, to the saints at Corinth, and the saints in, in Escorthy today. Because a saint is a sanctified one. It is one who has, who has been born again. A saint is someone who has been set apart for God. That is, a, that is a saint, and we're all saints. Because we have been washed and cleansed in the blood of Jesus when you have made Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life. Amen, St. Damien, you know. <laughs> you can put your name on that. It's not that we run around saying that. But in actual fact, from a biblical point of view, we are all saints who have made Jesus the Lord and Savior of our life. And you know, he, he said that he was a sinner. And, I, and you know what? We all came to Jesus as a sinner. And thank God when you receive Jesus, you become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. But he, he knew that he needed a Savior. And he, he talked about him being, you know, a, a simple country person. And he called himself the least of all believers. And you know what? This just sounds like the way the Apostle Paul talked, that he called himself the least of all the apostles. This was a man who was, who was humble. And you know, when he came to Ireland, he came with, 
you know, no interest in God when he was taken as slave. But when he came to Ireland as a slave, that's where he experienced true faith in Jesus Christ. You know, up until that, he said he had a lack of faith. But then he made Jesus the Lord and Savior of his life as a slave. He said, I turned with all my heart to the Lord my God. And he looked down on my lowliness and had mercy on my youthful ignorance. You know, he, he turned to God with all of his heart. So you can see what Patrick, he was a man who turned to God wholeheartedly. And you know what? For us as believers, we need to be people that are saved, but also have our heart turned towards God so that God can use us in a mighty, mighty way. When he received salvation, he said this. He said that, I, that, that is why I cannot be silent, nor would it be good to do so about such great blessings and such a great gift that the Lord so kindly bestowed in the land of my captivity. Here was a man who was a slave who got saved, and he's a slave in Ireland, and he's, I can't but tell people about Jesus. For the mercy, God, that you have extended towards me. It's not your surroundings that stops you from praising. It's not your circumstances that stop you from praising. It's a hard attitude. When you realize that you have salvation, you have something greater than anything that this world can throw at you. And you, you, when you understand the, the, the concept of eternity that, and, and the concept of salvation and the concept that you could never save yourself, that you were not good enough to save yourself, and you received Jesus as the Lord and Savior of your life, and you received eternal life, how can you not praise Him? Amen. You have something today that is greater than anything that money can buy. You know, we're not redeemed, the Bible says, we're with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus He talked about, how could I repay this? How could I repay this debt? And the reality of it is, is you can't repay the debt of salvation. You cannot repay what Jesus has done for you. The only thing you can do with a gift is receive it and say, thank you. That is the only thing you can do. And then use your life to tell other people about what Jesus has done for you. You know, as as a A songwriter, um, you call him Don Francisco, and he used to sing this song based on the Gospels when Jesus would tell people, don't don't tell anybody what I've done for you. And what would they do? They would go and tell everybody what Jesus has done. And he wrote a song called, I've got to tell somebody. I've got to tell somebody. I've got to tell somebody. I've got to tell somebody what Jesus did for me. And you know what? When Jesus has changed your life, you have to tell someone what he's done for you. That's what happened with Patrick, a 16-year-old taken into slavery who realized, God, I need you. I need you in my life. Receive Jesus as his Lord and Savior and as a slave used his life to tell people what Jesus done for him. You won't hear that being taught today. You won't, you won't, you, like it's St. Patrick's Day today, and I, I would doubt it if, if they'll even show the Patrick mu- movie that was made the other day, or the other week, or the other year, praise the Lord. <laughs> Somebody wake me up. But you know what? On a day like today, we should be celebrating the life of someone who lived for Jesus, but that doesn't go with our generation today. But you know what? We have Jesus living in us. And we need to do the same things that, that he did. Um, Patrick talked about the mercy of God. Um, he talked about how that, he said, I was like a stone lying deep in the mud. Then, who, then he who is powerful came, and in his mercy he pulled me out and lifted me up and placed me on a, a very top of a wall. And then he talked again, that is why I must shout aloud you know, of the Lord. Shout aloud of what Jesus has done for me. He recognized that I was pulled up. Do you know what? We were taken out of the Mary clay, and we were set upon a rock. In Patrick's writings, he talks about the Trinity. That's why you often see the shamrock, um, to symbolize that. But he talked about the Trinity. He talked about God the Father. He talked about Jesus, that everything is made, was made by him and made for him. He talked about the Holy Ghost. And you can see that Patrick was not a man 
of religious traditions, but he was a man of God's Word. He believed what God said. Amen? And he had a real hunger for relationship with God. You know, he, the Bible, or not the Bible, his writings. You can look all of these up. If you want to look these up, look up Patrick's Confessions. It is his own words about his life. Not what the tra tradition has said. It's what Patrick said himself about his life. Um, he said, um, after I arrived in Ireland, in Ireland I um, tended sheep every day, and I prayed frequently during the day. More and more, the love of God increased. And my sense and awe before God, uh, and my sense and awe before God, faith grew, and my spirit was moved. And he says, I prayed up to a hundred times. This is during the day, and at night, perhaps the same, he said. So this was a man who learned how to be in constant relationship with God. A man who prayed. And he said that he prayed in all weathers. He prayed in the, in the, in the snow. He prayed in the rain. Well, he plenty of that when he was in Ireland. Um, <laughs> icy conditions. You know, in the, in the woods, in the mountains. He just prayed. He was a praying man. And he says, as I now, or as I realize now, the Spirit was burning in me at that time. And that's why he was doing This was a slave. This was a guy who was taken captive, received Jesus, was so grateful to God. And how did he spend his time? He spent his time in communication with God. He was a shepherd when he was here. And it's amazing in the Bible how many shepherds became leaders in the Bible. Do you know why? Because shepherds serve. You learn to serve. You learn to lay down your life for the sheep. And there's no greater shepherd and example in the Lord Jesus Christ who laid down his life for us, the good shepherd. He was not a hireling. He, didn't, he wasn't someone who was just in it for the money. Jesus was in it for souls. And he loved souls. And I'm telling you, when you walk with Jesus, you'll love souls as well. Patrick was a shepherd, but he walked with God. He was able to spend time with God. And just like David as well, who was a shepherd, he was able to learn from God. And you know what? He had a passion and a desire for souls. And he had a passion and desire for Ireland to see people in Ireland saved. Do you know what? I don't care what country you have come from to come to Ireland. Come to Ireland to see people saved. Have a passion to reach this island. Praise God. Have a passion to reach the people on this island. Don't disqualify yourself and say, I can't reach people because I'm from a different nation. Let me tell you, everybody needs Jesus. Everybody needs Jesus. You know what? And people are crying out for answers. And you know what? You can, you can shut off Jesus in the media, but there's eternity in the heart of every man. And everyone knows there's more to life than this. And all they need to do is get quiet and their heart speaks to them. And people need an encounter with Jesus. And we're here for that as believers. And you know what? It's fitting on St. Patrick's Day to talk about a man who loved Jesus. A man who was on fire. A man who prayed because he said the Spirit of God was burning in him. Amen. Well, that's my heart's cry for this island that the Christians in this island will not be religious, but the Christians in this island will have a burning passion for the Lord Jesus Christ. And just like with Patrick, do you know where that came from? Spending time with God. He prayed. Amen. So as a slave, what happened then with Patrick? Patrick had a dream. And in the dream... God let him know that your ship is ready. And he had to go 200 miles away to get on a ship to a place that he didn't know. So he left Ireland at this time. God told him to leave. And he went 200 miles and met people. And they were pagans, okay? That's the way Ireland was at that time. And he was trying to get a ship on the ship with him. And, you know, they were not going to take him. And he walked away and he prayed. And as he was praying, 
you know, he had word to come back, they're going to let you go now. But they wanted him to, to um, do a, a, a pagan ritual kind of a thing, to get onto the boat, and he would not compromise. And I tell you, we need Christians in our generation that do not compromise, do not bow the knee, but stand for what is right. When you have a real relationship with God, when you have had an encounter with Jesus Christ, when you see what He has done for you, you don't need to bow your knee to anything else. You just need to serve Him. And if it costs you, so be it. That's the attitude that we need to have, that we are going to serve Jesus. And they asked Patrick, it was some kind of weird kind of pagan, thank God we're delivered from all of that. But they wanted, the, these men wanted him for whatever reason to suck their breasts, you know. Thank God we don't have any of that rubbish in our generation. But it was some kind of symbolism just to, to show that you're one or whatever. I don't know what it was for, but he refused to do it. He refused. He did not compromise. And you know what? And they did travel. He went back to England. And as they were traveling, you know what? This isn't in the time of, you know, like easy, easy travel. They were going for 28 days and all their food ran out. And they were starving. And the people started basically making fun of him. Basically, where's your God and all of these kind of things. But, you know, he said he prayed with confidence that God would supply their needs and that they would be fed and told them, God will look after us today. And a herd of swine came by, and that was dinner, okay? And they were able to eat, and it says in his writings that even the, the, uh, the dogs were fed and filled. But here's what happened. It said they looked at him differently after that day. Do you know why? Because they realized that God was with him. And I'm telling you, when you compromise, they can't see Jesus in you. But whenever you stand up for Jesus in your generation, they'll see that you have something different. We need Christians that don't compromise. We're in the world, but we're not off it. We love the world, but we don't do the same things as the world. We have the life of God in us. Amen? It doesn't, we're not dead, and we're not dull, and we're not boring. The worst, thing that, the worst witness to this world is a boring Christian. You know, here they come. Ooh. You know, we don't need to be like that. We have, we have a joy that the world didn't give. We have a peace that the world didn't give. We have a contentment that you can't get anywhere else. You get it in a relationship with God. Amen? It's, we have, a, we have a, an amazing life in Jesus. And we don't have to compromise. Thank God for people who love God, who worship God, who love the Word of God who are thankful for what Jesus has done for them, who can't keep quiet and will not compromise. That's Patrick. Not somebody coming. No, Patrick was full of life. And I don't do that to criticize, but all I'm saying is this. I don't want to be full of religion. I don't want to be a watered-down version of what Jesus has called us to be. We are people who are living in our generation. We don't need to make apologies for what Jesus has done for us. We don't need to make apologies for the goodness of God. When God blesses your life and increases you or gets you that job or adds things to your life, you don't have to apologize. You walk with the living God. There should be a difference between us and people who are not walking with God. There should be a life about us that they do not have. But it's not to put it in their face as in to push people away. It's so that we can, we can be that light so that it's like a moth to a flame. So that people can come to us and understand that we were saved by the grace of God. It had nothing to do with our goodness. We're not prideful. We're not arrogant. We're not, you know, standing up there like, I'm a child of God. We are a child of God, but it's not in pride. We're a child of God because He made us one, not because we deserved it. Amen? So we reach out and grace the people. Praise God. Amen? You know, after... St. Patrick had that experience um, with the, 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 the pigs running by and God meeting their needs. He had an attack, he said, where he says it was like a boulder, a rock hit him, and all of his limbs just stopped functioning. And he said he was attacked by 
Satan, but he cried out to God and God healed him. Here is a man who experienced the healing power of God. Amen. Now, he got back to his family, and I believe God brought him back to his family so that, you know, he's a slave, was taken six years up the street, and the next thing he's coming back through the door. Can you imagine how much that blessed his parents to see him again? And he went back home, and he stayed there for a period of time. But, you know, Patrick was a man who spent time with God, who prayed. And when you walk with God, you will walk in the supernatural. When you walk with God, you'll experience God. You'll experience the God that you cannot see with your eyes, but you will experience Him. And Patrick was a man of visions and dreams. And he had another dream. And in that dream, he seen a man coming to him with, with all of these letters and handed one to him. And in that letter, it said, the voice of the Irish. And if you read that, then he heard the voice of the Irish calling him back to Ireland. And this man who was a slave, who got out of that slavery, got back home, came back to the very country that enslaved him. Why? He was more free than anybody to tell people about Jesus. That's why he came back. He was a man who laid his life down. He heard the voice of the Irish people. Praise God. And he heard them say, we beg you, holy boy, to come and walk again among us. And that's exactly what he did. He went and came to Ireland. He also had an, another dream where Jesus told him that the one who gave his life for you, he it is who speaks in you. Amen. He said it was the authoritative voice. You know, we're his sheep, and we hear his voice. Amen. He said, I am greatly in debt to God. You know, the reality of it is, it's hard to hear. And remember, this was written hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Revelation is progressive. But when you make Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life, you're not in debt to God. All your debts are paid. At the cross, Jesus paid all your debts. Amen? We had a debt we couldn't pay. But Jesus paid it. He paid a debt he didn't owe. He paid your debt and he paid my debt. But his heart here was that I have to tell somebody about Jesus. You know, we have, the only debt we have is to tell people of the love of God, to bring the love of God to people, to love people, to bring people the gospel. And that's really the heart of what he was saying here. But he said, he gave me such great uh, grace that through me, many people should be born again in God and brought to full life. When do you ever hear that taught about Patrick? But that's in his own writings. He said he was a fisher of men. And he said that he was here to fulfill the great commission of what Jesus said to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And that's what Patrick did. He seen Ireland changed. And he said, how has this happened in Ireland? In other words, what he's saying is, God, how did you do this through someone like me? Because if you read in his writings, you will see he was a very humble man. He knew he wasn't all that. He knew he was a simple person in the sense of just ordinary, everyday person. But I tell you, when you hook up with the living God, things are going to get interesting in your life. Amen? You see, with you, it's impossible but when you hook up with God, it's amazing how things become possible. And we need to remove the impossible out of our lives when we walk with the God to whom nothing is too difficult and nothing is too hard. Don't speak impossible when you're walking with God. Speak all things are possible. Amen. All things are possible. Praise God. But that was just the way he spoke. How did God, how God did you do that through someone like me. Here's another thing about Patrick as well. He was a man of sacrifice. He was a man of tremendous commitment. And he was a man who consecrated his whole life to God. He said, I would have loved, in his writings, he says, I would have loved to went back 
and visited my parents. But he said, when God called me to Ireland, he called me to stay here for the rest of my life. And he was faithful to do that. He was faithful to the call of God upon his life. Even though he had desires and to do other things. But you know what? The call of God was number one in his life. Walking with Jesus was number one. Telling people about what God done for him was number one in his life. Praise God. He says, perhaps, however, when I baptized so many thousands of people, I, did I hope to receive even the smallest payment? If so, tell me and I will return it to you. He was a man who didn't do it for money. You know what? God blesses us. God gives us richly all things to what? Enjoy, Timothy says. Money is not the problem. It's the love of money that's the problem. But you know, Patrick said that I didn't do things for money. I did it with a genuine, pure motive because I wanted to see Ireland saved. Praise God. Amen. And you can look at many of the things with his life there, but I'll tell you, what a life. And he lived his whole life here, and he, he died in Ireland, and he is buried in Ireland. A man who laid his life down for Jesus. And do you know what he did? He brought the gospel to this island. When he came here, he traveled. He traveled north and south, bringing the gospel to this island. And I'm telling you today, the gospel needs to go all across Ireland, north, south, east, and west. People need Jesus. But you know what? Well, one of those things, and I just want to hit on this for a bit today, and that was that I, that I said when Patrick prayed, and the reason he prayed and prayed the way he did was because he said he had a burning fire in him. Do you know, here's the thing about Patrick. Patrick was on fire for God. And you know what? God wants people who are on fire for him. Praise God. Praise God. On fire. Amen. You know, the reality of it is, is you are the light of the world. You know, Jesus said that he was the light of the world, but then he was going to heaven, and now we have his life in us. So now we are the light of the world. When the Bible talks about the light of the world and talks about light like that, it's talking about life. In John chapter 1, the life was the light. And so you have the life of God in you. You have that experience where you're connected with God. So you have a living experience with God, so you're the light of the world. And the Bible tells us over in Matthew, when it talks about being the light of the world, it uses the illustration of a candle. And what is a candle? A candle is a fire. And you have a fire that has been lit on the inside of you. It's there, okay? And it's in you. And that, when you're saved, that fire never goes out. Anytime you see in the Bible when God lit a fire, it was never meant to go out because God lit that fire. And when you got saved, you have a fire in you in your spirit. So it is there. But the Bible says, don't hide your light. So even if you're covered, it's still a fire, but it's not being seen. And the reason being is because it's covered. And you know, as a Christian, we don't need to live our lives covered. We don't need to be a Christian, so to speak, that's in the closet, okay? I know in our generation, people talk about coming out of the closet for whatever they're talking about. Do you understand? I'm telling you, there's some Christians need to come out of the closet that they're a Christian. Because there's a lot of Christians that are not seen. And you know what? We go to work and we, we go to school and we go to college and we're around people. We go to the sports club or whatever and we're around people and people don't see the difference in our lives because we're afraid to come out and expose it because we might get criticized. Somebody might make fun of us. We might have to, like Patrick, take a stand and say, no, I'm not sucking your nipples, you know, <laughs> to the man, okay? But you know what? That's what, that's, that's what he had to say. I know I'm making light of that. Sometimes you have to crack a joke so that a spoonful of medicine or a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down, you understand? But you know what? He didn't, he didn't say, I know that he wouldn't compromise in that situation. Do you know what? Sometimes when you come out, you're going to be asked questions that you're not used to being asked. But you know what? If you're going to stand for Jesus in this generation, you have to have a backbone. I'm telling you what, walking with Jesus is... <laughs> It's a contact sport. It's like the MMA. Some people say, oh, you, you, all of those wimps. 
serve God. That's because they're used to people walking around like, And if you, if you blow, they fall over. They're not used to people that can stand against the tide of liberalism and things like that in our generation. You can stand and say, I believe what God says. It takes a backbone to serve God. You know, when my kids growing up, I always told them, it, it takes a backbone. It takes a real man to serve God. Because anybody can hide and go with the crowd. Anybody can keep their mouth shut. But if you stand up and say, I believe this, it takes a real man to stand out from the crowd. The Bible says, quit yourselves like men. That's the women as well to have that strength. But when it says, quit yourselves like men, it's fight and talk. It's not that we're going out there to fight with people. They're our mission. We don't fight against flesh and blood. But you have to have a backbone in our generation. And so if you do come out of the closet as a Christian, you do face opposition. People might make fun of you. People might, might call you names or whatever. I've been called them all over the years. Here he comes, Holy Moses. Here's Holy Moses in the day, lads. And I tell you, I worked in a building site for years. And if you can survive a building site, you can survive anywhere. You know, up on top of a roof and 10 guys laughing at you and making fun of you. It's a contact sport. But I'm telling you, when you have a passion in you for Jesus, you can't keep quiet. So it's all about having a passion. God wants us to have a passion. Having a passion for Jesus doesn't mean to say you're running around like a lunatic. Having a passion for Jesus means you have something living in you that you can't keep quiet about. It'll be like Liverpool supporters today, today if they beat us. I support Man United. You know, you won't want to look at anything in social media because then you'll have to listen to them. Do you know what I mean? Because <laughs> there's a fire in there. <laughs> now, here's a couple of things about fire today. Many want to be on fire for God. Many you, you want your life to count. Amen? Here's a couple of things about fire. Number one, fire is seen. And as a believer, we need to be seen, just like I said a moment ago. Here's another thing. Fire gives off heat. It gives off something, or I'll put it that way. What it gives off is heat. It gives off something. You know, when you walk with Jesus, you'll give off something as well. I often say, like, there's people and they give off a fragrance because of what they're around. And it's leaping lizards. You know what I mean? It's, it's a stench. But the Bible says that Jesus is a sweet aroma. And what, you, what you're around, what you hang around, it gets on your life. You know, I, I can remember I worked in a garlic factory and I stunk. And here was the thing, I didn't know I stunk because everybody in the garlic factory smelled the same. And I can remember coming out one night and, and my uncle gave me a lift home and he said to me, well, Paul, this will be the first and the last time I will be ever picking you up from this place. As he says, you're absolutely stinking of garlic. Windows down the whole way home. Do you know why? Because it was, it was where I was. You give off, so heat gives off some, or sorry, fire gives off something, it gives off heat. But do you know what? If you work in a, a perfume shop, you'll give off a different fragrance. And what we hang about, you know, it's like if you go and you um, go on holidays and you just expose yourself to the sun, do you know what? It's going to be seen. Because you're going to be seen what you're exposed to. It, it, it reflects off your life. And you know what? As believers, you know what? The fire in us needs to be seen. Um, a fire is always moving. If you look at a fire, it's never still. It's always moving. Even a candle. It's always moving. It flickers. It's never still. Do you know why? Because it's alive. And you know, as a believer, we need to be living. We need to have that life. We need to have something coming out of us that's living. Amen. Another thing about a fire is a fire puts you to sleep. And that's a good thing. Because whatever you're asleep to, biblically, you're awake to the opposite of that. Okay? So if you get on fire for God, you'll go asleep to the things of this world. And that's what happens when you are awake to the things of God. You, there's a lot of things you don't want to be a part of anymore because you're awake to something. 
People say to me, you walk, oh yeah, but not the way you think. I'm woke to the things of God. Because the Bible tells us not to be asleep among the dead. That means don't be asleep and just live in a Christian life like everybody else and being a normal person. No, we're meant to be awake. A living person is different than a dead person. A living person is something happening. They're moving. They're breathing. They've, they've life about them. They're going somewhere. They're doing something. When, when we're on fire for God, that's how God sees us. Open them, praying, God, use my life. Being effective. You know, I want to get involved in church. I wanted my life to count. So if you're awake to God, you're asleep to the world. But the problem is if the world can get you awake to it, it's amazing how the fire goes out towards the things of God. And it never truly goes out for a believer, but it can just be embers. You know what I mean? Not a blaze. Another thing, fire cons consumes. I know at 19 years of age, when I met Jesus, the Lord and Savior of my life, my dreams and passions and desires were consumed by God's dreams, desires, and passions. You know, a month earlier, I always say, I'm in all night raves. <laughs> Glow sticks. <laughs> Dancing for five hours nonstop. And then collapsing. Well, literally, that's what, that was it. I had a passion for it. Then make Jesus the Lord and Savior of my life. And I'm going out with my mom on a Saturday night to a meeting in somebody's house. With all older people in it. And the old people smell and everything in the room. And here's me, 19 years of age, praising Jesus. Outwardly, it looked weird. But inwardly, I didn't understand things, but I knew I have a passion in me I didn't have before. You know what it was? When you hang around fire, it consumes all of the stuff that doesn't need to be there. Fire is a cleanser. When you heat up metal, what happens is the impurities come to the top. And then they can be, it's dross, and it can be removed. And what happens is you become more refined. And you know what? When you hang around the fire and you hang around the move of God, things start falling off your life. Praise the Lord. Amen. Um, and as I said, God's fire, it never goes out. Another thing about fire is fire spreads. And that's what happened with Patrick. See, he had a fire for God. And that fire, he couldn't keep it to himself. He couldn't keep quiet. It spread. It's a naked flame. It's not contained. You know what? If you, if you get a candle, it's contained so that that fire can't spread outside of the glass that it's in. It's contained. And you know what the devil would love to do with us is to keep our fire contained so that we don't go to Bon... Is it Bon Crotty? Bon Clotty. So that we don't go to Bon Clotty. So that we don't go to the places in the area. So that we don't tell people about Jesus. It would be great to just keep them all contained. But I'm telling you, you're not designed to be contained. You're a fire. You're designed to spread. Amen? That's what you're designed to do. And it's a wonderful thing about fire is that it can spread. And so that's why we need to be a fire. We don't need to be someone that's away from the fire. We need to be part of the fire, part of the church, part of the move of God. Come on a Sunday morning Keep that fire stoked in your life. All through the week, have a relationship with God. Stay in fire for God so that everywhere you go, you be effective. That's what God wants for our life. You know, whenever I was a young lad, we set a fire. It was, you know, dried out reeds and stuff like that. And we set a fire. And the wind caught it. And I tell you, and it took off, and so did we. Amen. We took off, and next thing all we heard, somebody phoned the fire brigade, woo, 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 and it was amazing. We denied all. We didn't see it. We did not see it, but we started it. <laughs> We'd knock at the door. Did you start that fire? No, 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 we were not there. You know, we were young lads, and praise God, Jesus has forgiven me of all of that, so don't hold it against me. But the point about it is, it's amazing. You, a fire can spread, and you might think, who am I? Who is Patrick? Who was Patrick? You might think, you know what, I'm not going to come out of the, the, the closet and be a Christian, so to speak, in my school, because I could be the only one in my class. 
Well, praise God, the fire spreads. Fire spreads. Amen. Romans 12 and verse 11 says, Don't be slothful in business, but to be fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. And what fervent means is to serve God aglow. Serve Him boiling over. Serve Him ablaze. God wants us to be ablaze for Him. Amen? Now, let me just call out three things and I'll close here today. There's three places you need the Word of God in you if you want to have fire. Number one, you need it in your heart. Do you remember Jesus walked with the two disciples after he was raised from the dead on the road to Emmaus? And after Jesus talked to him, Jesus talked from the Scriptures. He talked from the Psalms. And he talked from, you know, the law. But what he was doing was revealing himself. He was showing himself in the types and the shadows. And the two disciples later, they said, did not our hearts burn within us when he talked with us on the way? That's in Luke 24 and verse 32. You'll find that scripture. Did not our hearts burn within us? See the word of God? The word of God will put a fire in you. When you see Jesus, who he is and what he has done for you, who you are in Christ Jesus, you'll have what I always call heartburn. You'll have heartburn. And there's not enough Galvis gone in the world to put that out when you get on fire for Jesus. Amen. Next place you need fire is the same principle, but it's you need it in your bones. In Jeremiah 20 and verse 9, he said, you know what, I'm going to be a good boy, basically, is what he said. I'm going to be a good boy, and I'm not going to say anything today. But he said, but I couldn't keep it quiet, just like Patrick said. He says, because his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. How do you get fire in your bones? This word needs to come alive in you. Praise God. The word of God is living. It'll put a fire in you. Amen. It's like, I always say, like Rocky. You ever watch Rocky? Remember Rocky's trainer, Mickey? He lived and breathed boxing. He was boxing on the brain. Let me tell you, as believers, we need to be Jesus on the brain, souls on the brain, the call of God on the brain, where we are consumed. That's what fire does. It consumes you with a passion for God. And number three, you need fire in your mouth. The Bible said on the day of Pentecost that cloven tongues of fire sat on them. And then where did it get in their mouth? I'm telling you, you want to stay on fire for God, you pray. And you want to stay on fire, really stay on fire for God? Be full of the Holy Ghost and pray in other tongues. Amen. Amen. I've been serving God for 30 years now. And what has kept me with a passion for God is those two things, having the Word of God and having the Spirit of God. People are looking for a formula. People look for all of these things to have passion and all of these things for God. And I tell you, many times people bypass the Word and prayer. And you cannot bypass the Word and prayer. What was key in Patrick's life? The Word of God and prayer. You know what will be key in our life as well? The Word of God and prayer. When you have the Word of God and prayer, you will be a Christian that's connected to God. And when you're connected with God, let me tell you, you'll be a person on fire for God. Amen? John Wesley said, light yourself on fire for a passion, with a passion for God and people will watch you come and watch you burn. You know what? People are looking to see people who are on fire for God. They don't want to see some shriveled up, dry, you know what, miserable, finger-pointing, condemning Christian. They want to see someone who is living with a passion and a zeal, who is sold out for the things of God. That's what's attractive. What is attractive is someone who is passionate about Jesus. You know what it's like in football, you have you know, fans like me who take it or leave it, and then you have real fans who are really into it. 
But I'm telling you, when it comes to Jesus, don't be a take it or leave it person in Jesus. Be as someone who is turned on with a passion. Smith Wigglesworth said, I see people from time to time very slack, cold, and indifferent. But after they get filled with the Holy Ghost, they become a blaze for God. Amen. The best thing we can do on St. Patrick's Day is be full of Jesus. Amen. I know what, go and enjoy your day. My kids will be leaving church this morning, and you know what, and I'll enjoy the day. But you know what? We need to do that too. We need to enjoy our lives. We, you know what? We're not bores in that sense. But you know what? We're, we're, we, for us as believers, we're serving the same Jesus. And we have the same passion for souls. Amen.